All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, this is my first time at the Linux Application Summit. Um, but uh, my background, I've, I've done a lot of work um, in uh, Linux application space. Um, I spend a lot of my career um, working on Ubuntu um, as, a, as a developer um, and a community outreach person. Um, and that was of all volunteer work. Um, and then I moved into other um, areas of open source. Um, so what brings me here today is to talk to you about what I do for my j day job these days. Um, so I work over at IBM. And I was looking for sort of a change in my career. I was really interested in Linux desktop, and then I was working as a Linux sysadmin for about 15 years. Um, but I, and I'd gotten into the cloud world um, and had been working on OpenStack and containers um, and all kinds of things that we think of when we think of the modern like DevOps movement, SRE. Um, but when I about a couple of years ago. I thought, you know, everyone else is going over to Kubernetes and working on that cool new infrastructure thing. But I was wondering what else was out there. Um, so I was approached by IBM. They said, do you want to work on mainframes? And I was like, no. <laughs> um, but uh, they convinced me. Um, I was able to talk to a bunch of their technical staff. Um, I was able to dive into some of the open source work that's being done on the mainframe, um, which I'll talk about in this talk. Um, and the state of Linux on the mainframe, which it turns out has been around for 20 years. Linux has been running on this hardware over 20 years, actually. So that is what I'm here to talk to you about and how you can get your application to run on it. There's a bunch of free resources out there um, that allow you to uh, uh, develop an application on this platform. All right. So the first question I want to answer is what exactly a mainframe is. Because when I started talking to IBM, I wasn't sure what they were. I knew they were big computers. I know they were, they've been around longer than I have. <laughs> uh, but most of what I knew about mainframes was kind of like they were this vague, big computer that I've never seen and probably would never work on because they're really complicated. Um, and they, you know, they, I didn't think that they ran the software that I was interested in. I didn't think they did anything that that would have I, I would have ever crossed paths with. I also didn't realize how pervasive they still are in the industry. Um, this mainframe business is a multi-billion-dollar industry. Um, every time you swipe a credit card. Um, there is a very, very, very high chance that it is going through a mainframe somewhere in the world. Um, whether it's, and, and, and so it's huge in finance, it's huge in health tech, um, it's huge in the insurance agency, most of the airlines still run on mainframes. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, and this picture here is a, a photograph of a mainframe in a data center. So these days, they don't take up a whole room. Um, they each each like section of the rack. There's four of them in this picture that, that have the blue on it. Um, each section of the rack is 19 inches wide, so they fit into a standard 19 inch rack spot. You no longer have to have a special place in your data center for this mainframe. Um, when you open it up, uh, this is what it looks like inside. Um, it's a little hard to see because this is so small. <laughs> Um, but the main things that I wanted to point out was that there is no storage inside of a mainframe. All the storage is going to be external, so you attach a storage device. There's a bunch of companies that make them. And then inside, it's pretty much all processing power. So you've got your CPUs, your memory, your PCIe cards. Um, and so like the, th the five red, 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 red um, boxes in the middle are your CPUs, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then most of the rest of this is all of your like IO cards, your cryptographic cards, all of the specialized cards that make a mainframe really special and very good at processing data. Um, in the model that was released last year, um, you have a water cooled option, which is pretty much the standard um, for these systems. But they also have an air cooled version. And you can get this in either one frame two, three, or four frames. So if you get the four frame one like pictured here, that's like the totally maxed out system that you can get. And you can cluster mainframes. So you can have multiple. Um, and so you can scale scale horizontally that way. Um, 
yeah, so this one actually is the water cooled system here. And those CPUs. So the really key thing for this entire talk is that they are not x86. Uh, depending on who you talk to, you'll see people refer to it as IBM Z, um, which is probably how I'll refer to it in the rest of this talk. Um, and S390X is how you might see it if you are in the open source world or in the Linux world and are looking for the binaries for this architecture. Um, if you come from sort of the mainframe um, background, you might refer to it as Z architecture. Uh, the CPUs themselves, um, if you have a maxed out system, um, there are 190 of these processors inside that four frame machine. Um, each processor has 12 cores and each processor also has really big caches. And that's one of the defining characteristics of this architecture is that these systems were built for um, uh, processing data. So if you think back to the 1960s when the first ones were released, the only companies that needed computers were ones that were doing processing, a lot, ones that were doing a lot of work with data. So they were either processing data or storing data. So as we think back to the industries I mentioned in the beginning, we're thinking about banks, we're thinking about airlines, and ones who need to have data because there was no Facebook back then. Like you didn't need to store your store random data about people. It was really industries that were data focused back in the day. And the systems are still geared towards data. Um, in a fully decked out system, you get 40 terabytes of RAM. I mentioned all those PCIe cards. Um, and the, so there's 12 drawers of those. Um, and they, there are also these processors called SAPs, um, which are dedicated purely to IO. So when you're doing IO, um, you don't have to take away from the like the general processing power. There are specific processors in there that just handle IO. And again, this is because of the data focus of the systems. So there's there's an interesting question or comment in the chat, and some someone mentioned that that um, she had seen S390X while doing some some work on SUSE, and they didn't know what they what it was for months. <laughs> yeah, so. That, th that is a great segue into this slide. Um, so I wanted to stop for a moment, just talk about other architectures in general. Um, so the Kubernetes project is just one that I like to bring up as, as an example, as an infrastructure person myself. Um, they release binaries for their servers and their clients in multiple architectures. Um, so if you wanna go through the list of what they release their server, their Kubernetes server as, um, one of them is AMD64, which you're probably familiar with. That's your standard 64-bit x86 machine. Um, that's you know gonna be in your standard laptop and not much longer for Apple, but <laughs> uh, the you know, desktop and server, that's it's pretty much what you're gonna get if you you know load up any any random system. And so that is Oh, and if you're interested in like architecture history, finding out how x86 became the dominant architecture in the industry is a fascinating story. And it has very little to do with technology. There's a lot of politics involved in like back in the 80, 86 days. But that's way off topic. <laughs> um, another one you might see around is ARM. Of course, ARM is an ARM HF. Those are, those are what are in the older cell phones um, and also the Raspberry Pi one and two. So that's a 32 bit ARM. Um, ARM64 is the more modern version of ARM, again, 64-bit. Um, that's ARM, so that's in all the modern cell phones, both Android and, and, um, uh, and, and the uh, iPhones. Um, and that's also what's in the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4. So if you've ever played around with the Raspberry Pi, you have gotten your first taste of <laughs> uh, different architectures. Um, some of the stuff won't run because you have to compile it for that architecture. Um, the PPC64, um, so that is PowerPC 64-bit. Um, you'll find those in IBM's Power series of servers. So that's the Power 9 and the Power 10 systems. Um, the 64-bit um, PowerPC was also used in the Wii U system and the PS3 and the Xbox 360. So that like era of, of game consoles, I guess Wii U was a little after the other two, but um, there was a lot of PowerPC in gaming consoles for a while there. Um, the LE, that's in parentheses, which is what Kubernetes re releases as their binaries, that stands for Little Endian. Um, and that means 
PowerPC is typically big endian, which has to do with um, how, how memory is handled in the system. But the version that is becoming increasingly popular is the little endian version, because every other processor I've described on this list is a little endian processor. And that matters when you're porting software. So PowerPC has both versions. And then coming again to the S390X, which I'm talking about here, that is big endian. So on this list, PowerPC has both, S390X is big endian, the rest are little. So that is your, your very quick tour of hardware architectures. And I had to try really hard not to dive too deep into this because you can get, there's like many, many talks about this topic. <laughs> so mainframes, IBM Z, where, where did these things come from anyway? Um, so one of the things that I, that really pulled me in when I was learning about this architecture and these systems was that they have a really strong open source legacy, it turns out. Like I was thinking, you know, IBM controls everything and they have this proprietary ecosystem and this whole thing. But when I was reading about it, it turns out that there's this organization called SHARE. It was founded in 1955. And so it is the longest continuously running open or, or uh, computer user group in the world. Um, so that's pretty cool. They just, they just celebrated an anniversary this year and they had to have a virtual event, which was sad, but <laughs> next year we'll all get back together. Um, and one of the key resources back in the 1950s was the share library. Um, and that's a library of software that the developers of this, these first computers, um, the first commercial computers were sharing freely among each other. Um, it wasn't really open source in the way we think of it now because there wasn't, you know, licensing and, and legal stuff getting away. It was just, this was, source code was the only way people could share code. Um, in 1959, the organization came together and released the first operating system that really ever existed that had like certain components that you would generally call an operating system. So it was called SOS. Um, and if you go to Wikipedia and read about SOS, it, they, they say it's, it's one of the, the first instances of commons-based peer production, now widely used in development of free and open source software, such as Linux and the GNU project. So it's, it's funny to me because when I, when I look back at histories of open source and histories of, of things like Linux, um, Unix plays a very, very, like a starring role in all of these stories. Um, but Unix only dates back to the 1970s. Um, here we're looking back all the way into the 50s of people sharing software. So share is super cool. There's lots of great people who weren't part of this organization. And it's all focused um, on mainframe. I mentioned at the beginning uh, that Linux runs on the mainframe and it has for over 20 years. Um, again, like with this open source legacy, like this all started out um, as, as a community project as well. Um, if anyone was around in the late 90s playing around with Linux, this was the era of like putting Linux on a dead badger. Um, that was a series of essays about, you know, um, about like funny essays about Linux and then where it was in the late 90s. Um, so people were just putting Linux on everything because you could. It was open source, it was really lean at the time and people were trying to experiment and geek out about it. Um, if you do go into the history of Linux, it's it's on IBM Z, it's, it's really fun because you, the, like if you're a Linux nerd at all, you'll totally see yourself in their reasons for porting it. Um, they ported it because it was there, <laughs> like it existed, it seemed fun. Um, they ported it because it was an interesting challenge. Um, and then if you go down their list, they're like, oh yeah, the IO is really fast and it does all this great stuff. So it'd be cool to run Linux on it. But you know, at the heart, I know it's those first few reasons. <laughs> um, and so there was a community effort working on this, getting it running. Um, and then it turns out IBM was simultaneously um, working on, on, a, on a Linux version as well. And so they released their first series of kernel patches. For, I think it was a 2.2 kernel um, in December of 1999. These were pretty much just like blobs, like here, this is how to get it to run. Um, in October 2000, um, SUSE Enterprise Server became the first um, still in production enterprise Linux to run on S390X architecture. Um, there's an interesting story here. Um, so I know that it's really just um, a marketing thing, right? Like when, when uh, 
Suze rebranded to call itself Enterprise Linux Server and all this stuff. But the first Suze Enterprise Server was called Enterprise Server because it ran on S390X. It was Enterprise because it ran on Enterprise hardware. The x86 version of Suze Enterprise Server actually came a few months after the mainframe version. Um, which is funny to me because then I get to tell people that the Suze Enterprise, the x86 version is the port. The mainframe version is the original. I know it's not true, but it's funny anyway. <laughs> Um, so Suze was the first, um, Red Hat, like just a couple months later, they, they followed, they were the second one that's like still an enterprise Linux that runs on, on the mainframe. Um, and then, and then long, you know, several years afterwards, late, late in 2016, um, Ubuntu became, to, came to support, um, the platform with their, uh, 1604 release. So when we talk about Linux on the mainframe, it's not some, special IBM thing. It's not some special proprietary thing. It really is like these Linuxes that we know and love already. Um, I also have a slide coming up with other distributions, the community supported ones that are all on there. Um, so at the beginning of this deck, this presentation, I showed you some mainframes with, with a blue cover on them. Uh, the ones with the orange cover are called Linux One, and those only run Linux. So there's a bunch of traditional mainframe operating systems, proprietary ones that IBM sells that exist out there. But the Linux one it only runs Linux. Uh, the first one from IBM was released in 2015. And we called them the Emperor and the Rock Hopper, named after penguins. Um, in 2017, just two years later, the Emperor 2 and the Rock Hopper 2 came out. And then just last year, the Linux one 3 came out. And they dropped the penguin names. I don't know why. I guess the whimsy had run out of IBM. <laughs> but we don't use penguins in, in, in the marketing anymore, which is sad. But here we are. So the point here is, like, I'm not here to sell you one because I I'm that's not my job and I don't know how. I don't even know how much they cost. Um, but the interesting thing here is, like, not only has IBM created a Linux-only mainframe, um, they keep creating it. Every two years, we've been coming out with a new one. Like, they're really an audience here and people who are using this and a real community around this, um, which is one of the things that's that's been most exciting for me to learn about um, in this role, working at IBM on open source things. So this is what we're here to actually talk about, running your application on a mainframe. So um, we just had that Wayland talk and I know a lot of the talks are very geared towards graphical applications and that is where I'm going to disappoint you. <laughs> because if you have a graphical application, it's probably not going to run on the mainframe. Um, I don't know if X server has actually been ported, um, but I don't know why anyone would bother. Um, your interaction with the mainframe is really um, text-based. Um, so you're either using something like Unix system services or you're using Linux or directly. Um, the way you interact with the systems running on it is through something called ZVM, which is a virtualization top uh, uh, technology, or you're running it on something like KVM, um, which runs a super slim Linux, like on bare metal in the mainframe, and then you run KVM on top of that. Um, so the way you interact with it is very um, not graphical. <laughs> um, so this is the first thing. There's there's not a lot of there's not really graphical apps on the mainframe. Um, if you are running something like a web app, um, if you're using Node.js, if you're using Python frameworks, this is perfectly fine. Um, Node and Python interpreters have been ported to, 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 to IBM Z. They've been around for years now. And so typically, if you're running Node or Python or something, like it, it can just run. It's fine. If you're focused on server-side apps, again, like this is what these machines were made to do. Um, if your app is dri data-driven, um, I've talked about this already. Like seriously, that is literally what mainframes were built to do. They were built to deal, deal with data. And all the engineers, thousands of engineers who are still working on the new processors and the new hardware, like their focus is all about data. Um, which is why we, we t like one of the big pushes for IBM is like the hybrid cloud story because the, the cloud is, is like a, a great technology for people to be using for their infrastructure. Um, but if you're really focused on data, data transfers are really expensive. Um, data storage in the cloud is really expensive. And x86 was not developed for 
data processing like like uh, the mainframes were. So if you do have a data-driven app, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, also, if your application is somehow dependent on encryption, oops, I, I wrote encryption and encryption. I meant encryption and decryption. <laughs> Um, like the cryptographic hardware in these things is one of the most exciting things for me um, when I started learning about this because um, the uh, there are crypto coprocessors inside of every CPU and so you don't necessarily have to take away from general computing power to do crypto which means you can encrypt like all of your data you can use IPsec to encrypt it in flight. You can use DM crypt on the kernel level to encrypt it on the disk. And you don't pull away from general processing power. Um, I have a couple of servers behind me in here, little x86 ones. And it like the, just doing encryption on these machines takes like a ton of my CPU. <laughs> um, so I'm not super thrilled about that. I should have gotten more powerful CPUs in these things. But encryption really does chew up your CPU. Um, and, and one of the things that you know, we've been we've been sort of telling people about is that blockchain runs really well on a mainframe. If you were to like purpose build a machine for blockchain, it would probably look a lot like a mainframe between the data processing and the encryption stuff. Like that is what they're built to do. So now getting to the question, like, is this some strange like side thing? Um, a couple of people mentioned in the chat that Fire, the Firefox is built for S390X. So hey, there's a graphical app that's built for it. Um, I'm going to have to play around with some graphical apps after this, because I don't, uh, yeah. If Firefox is built for it, then like, there's definitely some stuff going on there with, with X. <laughs> Um, so yeah, there's lots of other projects out there. Um, this one is kind of like our, our like vanity slide. Um, there is not a comprehensive list really. Um, we, I'll talk about it later, but we do have a software search tool that searches the, the, the three distributions that I mentioned, um, for, for packages. Um, but this is kind of like when, when people want to see like real projects are being ported to this, this, um, uh, architecture, like yes, they totally are. Um, you'll see. Also, there's community versions of Linux, so Debian, OpenSUSE, um, Fedora. Um, Clef OS is a uh, version of uh, CentOS that's maintained. It's an S390X port, um, and Alpine, the one that's that's commonly used with containers, um, that one's been ported. That was done by, um, and um, I think a mentee at the Open Mainframe project ported Alpine. Um, and then like all these other ones. Um, there's a link here that I'll, I also link to like in the slides, this is just an image. Um, and these ones are like the list that like IBM maintains concurrency on by working with the open source community. But a bunch of open source communities, like people just do it on their own. Like they maintain some of the ports. And I think we have some of the people in the audience who've, who've worked on <laughs> this stuff. Um, if you're into um, containers, um, uh, Docker Hub has a way to search by architecture, um, and so there's a there's a bunch of official images out there um, for uh, S390X as well. So you don't have to focus just on on one side. You can look into the container world too. There's a bunch of stuff you can grab. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is with regard to like specifically dealing with open source, the first thing is is like, how do you find other software projects that are already running on S390X? So my first recommendation would be, um, actually, which I didn't list here was, was uh, search in your own distribution. So if you've got um, a, a VM, which which I can tell you how to get um, running on Red Hat, you just do you know a yum search and see if see if it's already there. Um, the first thing I did when I got my first uh, VM on S390X was I installed um, IRC, the, the IRC chat client, and Screen. And I hopped on IRC and I like piped a bunch of out output to my friends. And I'm like, look, I've got a VM on a mainframe. How cool is that? Um, I mean, it was cool for me. <laughs> uh, my friends seem to appreciate it. But I can't imagine that like um, a text-based IRC client was something that someone like a customer requested or someone went out of their way to create. I think it was actually just something that, you know, Red Hat was like, let's just build everything we can. And it passed the tests and it worked. And so they shipped it. So cool. Like a lot of the software really just builds and works fine. 
Um, if it's not part of your distribution, um, you can go direct to the project. As, it, as you saw the Kubernetes download page, you saw the rest 390x binaries. Um, you can ask like if you're if you're a mainframe customer, you typically have a vendor who's providing you software as well. So you can talk about talk to the vendor. Um, there's this really cool website that the Open Mainframe Project, um, which is part of the Linux Foundation, um, has put together. So they it's called Landscape openmainframeproject.org and it allows you to scroll through a bunch of projects kind of like the slide I showed you and it's actually an evolution of that site so we created the slide and the guys at the open mainframe project were like hey that's really cool we did that um, and, and interactive version you can click through and see what the projects are about and the status of the S394 stuff um, IBM has a list verified software like not necessarily that that IBM supports, but we, we keep an eye on the ports and make sure that they're being updated by releases um, and that there's a specific interest in. Um, I mentioned there's an IBM Z search on Docker Hub. Um, and then a project that I'm working on right now um, is the Open Mainframe Project software discovery tool. And that one allows you to search um, Red, Hat, Red Hat Enterprise Linux SUSE and uh, and Ubuntu for binaries. Um, so if you search for you know, whatever um, software you're looking for, you can you can find it in that tool. Um, it's it's very early days. We're going to add all the, a bunch of other stuff to it too. So we don't want to just search Linux distributions. We also want to search for ZOS for traditional mainframe operating system stuff that's open source, and also search pretty much everything we can get our hands on <laughs> um, to make sure it's like a comprehensive search tool. So that's finding open source software. Um, the next step is if you have open source software, if you're developing open source software, what can you do to actually port your application? So again, open mainframe project. Like this is probably the reason I took the job with IBM Z. Um, being able to see a Linux Foundation sponsored project that was not controlled by IBM, that had a bunch of stakeholders, like their board and their technical board, they're not even dominated by IBM. IBM I think has like one seat um, on these boards, but they're a bunch of companies that got together and decided that they wanna do, like have a, 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 a place where they can do all their project hosting for like projects that they're developing collaboratively. So the open mainframe project, if you have a mainframe specific application, they'll do like your full project hosting. Um, so that like, it, they'll put it in their GitHub org, they'll give you a mailing list at list.openmainframeproject.org. You'll get a Slack channel, you can be interviewed on their podcasts and post on their blog. Um, they have forums, so like all the resources that you'd expect, um, a CI CD system. Um, for the software discovery tool, they're going to offer us web hosting space. So we can actually host the tool somewhere um, once once it's in that state. Um, but if you have an application that's not specific to the mainframe, um, they also provide resources for third party open source software projects. So um, just off the top of my head, I think Debian is one of the ones in this that um, gets support from the open mainframe project. And there's a bunch of other ones out there um, on the on their website that um, get VMs that are that are like given to them through the Open Mainframe project. Um, they also have an annual conference. Um, it was supposed to be in person this year for the first time, but alas, <laughs> nothing is in person. Um, so their their first conference was it was in September, um, and it was really cool because you got it's just the ecosystem around mainframe development and open source is is, is huge, and it was really impressive to me to see everyone speaking there. Uh, so the next one I want to talk about is the Linux One Community Cloud. Uh, so this is the one that I do most of my work on. Um, if you go to developer.ibm.com slash Linux One, um, it will give you a form to fill out in order to get access to a Linux VM. Um, that is a VM that's good for 120 days. Um, it's actually a really nice VM for a free thing that we we're giving away to people. <laughs> it's got a nice chunk of, a really big chunk of RAM, the CPU is really great. It's just, it's a really nice machine for, for what, I mean, for nothing. Um, so this gives you 120 days of access. Um, and the, the secret here is if it expires, you can, you can sign up again. You have to get a new VM, but <laughs> um, you can, you can sign up multiple times. Um, 
So that's really cool. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we, we encourage open source projects, if they're interested in doing this porting work, is to hop on the Linux One Community Cloud first, see if their application builds, um, and play around with it a bit. Um, and then if they're interested, they should reach out more formally to um, either the Open Mainframe Project or IBM. I'm usually the contact person for this, um, but I'm actually about to go on maternity leave, so I'll be gone for a few months. <laughs> um, but there's other folks on my team um, who you will be directed to um, to actually talk with IBM and get a longer-lived virtual machine. Um, so we support, I think, probably about 30 projects formally in our open source sphere, and then IBM has business relationships with a bunch of other projects. So if you're if you're a project with Red Hat or Microsoft, there's probably some sort of like official arrangement there. But if you're just like a normal grassroots, like old school kind of open source project, you'd be working with me because those are the ones that I'm supporting because I'm like, it, part of my job is outreach to um, the less, like the less cor corporate backed open source projects. Um, and then here's a link here um, for the Linux One Community Cloud community. And that's where, that's a forum and a blog and like just ways that people are collaborating and sharing things on the Linux One Community Cloud. And we just launched that. So there aren't very many people there. Most of the blog posts are from me. <laughs> um, but it's, it's one that we're growing because we want people to be able to share their experience. Um, so uh, another way, uh, so, my suggestion is to start off on something like either the Open Mainframe Project offerings or the Linux One Community Cloud. And then once you know that your software builds, um, you can use something like the Ubuntu Personal Package Archive. And that's on Launchpad. So if you're building uh, Debian Ubuntu packages, um, this is really where you want to go. Um, so you can, the Personal Package Archives allows you to create a deb, so you do have to know how to create a deb package. You upload the sources, source files for your deb package. And then you can build your um, your package, and then you get like a URL where people can you know put it in their sources.list, um, and then you have a way to deliver your software as well. So by default, it builds for AMD64. There's a little checkbox that you can build for Z Server S390X. Um, I think I think they call it IBM Z Server, but anyway, there's a little checkbox. So this is just like a simple app that I wrote in GoLang, like Hello World, and I packaged it for Debian and, or Ubuntu, and then I uploaded the source and it built it for me on, on Canonical's mainframe. It's like, cool. So that's on the Ubuntu side. Um, if you're using, uh, so you can also use the OpenSUSE build system or build service um, that, that SUSE hosts. Um, that, that will also build um, your package uh, for uh, S390X. Um, I, I, don't, I don't remember if you have to actually click it or if it'll automatically build it for you. I think it'll automatically build it for you. Um, and if it builds, awesome, like you're on your way. So OpenSUSE build service, build.opensuse.org. And that again runs on one of the mainframes that, that the SUSE company has. Um, in this case, um, you do have to have, just like with, with the Ubuntu PPAs, you have to know about dev packages. With the uh, OpenSUSE build service, you do have to know a bit about RPM packaging. Um, uh, but I mean, I wouldn't say it's easy, either one. They're not easy, um, but they are very well documented. So it's something you can learn. <laughs> Another way uh, that we have for testing and, and keeping up your, your system is uh, we partnered with the um, Oregon State Open Source Lab, the OSU OSL. Um, I love these folks. They're, they do so much great work for the open source community in, in, a, in a very independent way. Um, but they have a Jenkins service that they run um, that just has S390X builders. And so you can, if you're already using Jenkins, you can add the builders that you get from the OSU OS, OSL um, to your Jenkins, and then you can, you can build it into your CI CD pipeline. And this one's great because it's open source and it's run by some really great people. Um, sort of sticking with the CI CD train here, um, Travis, which is, is, it is proprietary, but um, they have a beta trial right now for open source projects. Um, and so you can build for multiple architectures. I just put the docs link here for multi CPU architectures because they now support um, ARM, um, S390X and uh, PowerPC. Um, so they have builders for all three of them. And if you're already using Travis, 
um, it's really just a simple edit in your Travis config to support other architectures. Um, so again, probably make sure your software runs first and then and then dump it in your, your Travis config and now you have builders. Um, um, I think you also have to be have your project on GitHub in order to use this, but you can see in the documentation what, what requirements are there. And that is where I'm winding down. Uh, so those are the free resources available and how you might go about it. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of close out by talking a little bit about programming languages here. Um, as I mentioned, in order to run your code on an architecture that is not what you wrote it for, um, the compiler or interpreter has to run on the architecture. So if your code is compiled, something like C or C++, then the compiler needs to be ported. Um, if it's interpreted like Python or Node, um, that those interpreters have to be written for the architecture. Um, in the case of, of Z, like, that's that's really straightforward. Um, most programming languages you're going to encounter have already been ported, um, so that's great. Um, but you do need you do need the, the compiler or interpreter there in order for it to run. Um, I also mentioned that it's Big Endian, and that gets you um, when you start doing memory specific um, operations inside of your code. Um, so you may start running into Endian errors, which is going to be very new for a lot of you. But I don't see it super often, honestly, unless you're doing really complicated data stuff. Um, but what I will say is that your code will probably run. Um, like, give it a try, build it, and see if it works. Um, if not, um, one of the things that we, you know, that we found because it makes sense um, is that like a higher level language, um, something like Node or Python, like those tend to run really well. Um, because they don't have as much hardware interaction. Like a lot of that is abstracted away. And that's what it means to be higher level. <laughs> um, uh, but lower level languages, they do do more hardware specific operations. So you may run into some things there with, with things like the, uh, when, you're, when you're working with C code. So it's more likely you'll run into Endian errors when you're running C. It's almost unheard of if you're running like Node. Unless the Node app somehow interacts with hardware, but that's incredibly uncommon. <laughs> and would be a very specific use case. Um, and, and I like to tell people like, when they start porting their applications, or they, when they start moving their like node applications over, they're like, oh, it's gonna work, it's gonna be perfect. Especially people on my team who like, are totally into this. And I'm like, okay, in a perfect world, absolutely yes. All these high level language will work flawlessly. But I will tell you right now that like, part of like a big chunk of the, the my job when I'm working on porting stuff, is dependencies. And, and what happens here is sometimes there are dependencies that are outside of your control or you do have to start building some things that haven't been ported yet. And it's a very good thing I take very good notes because I could end up like really deep down the rabbit hole like why, why am I building this one thing again? Oh because I need it for this other thing. So that can happen but I said don't let that scare you off. That's actually kind of fun. <laughs> And that is where I wanted to conclude. Um, so I think we have a couple minutes for questions if we have any. Um, but thank you so much for coming. Um, Thanks for it. All. We have some time for a couple of questions. The first question goes like this. At the OpenSUSE plus LibreOffice conference, there was a talk about emulations, containers, etc. YouTube link. One of the points brought up that was brought up was about having smaller hardware of S390. Is there any consideration from IBM on lowering the barrier to entry and alternative to the Open Mainframe project? That is a great question, and I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I really wish there was um, because, like, like we, we've been talking, we we talk about it, like even internally, like we want a baby mainframe. <laughs> we want just like a little tiny development box that we can just play around with, the, and it comes up in the community often too. But unfortunately, that's not. I don't. I don't have insight into any of that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I really wish we could just get a baby mainframe. <laughs> and the next question is: What kinds of applications are mainframes bad for? So. I mentioned like what they're good for is a lot of data driven stuff. Um, if your if your app like if your world is just like hosting a web front end, and you're not dealing with a lot of data stuff, like if you're really just um, pulling from different backends that have nothing to do with with data, if you're showing a lot of things, like I wouldn't recommend it to your standard. Just like 
app-based startup, like mainframe is not not really appropriate for everyone. Like if you really are doing data and you need it to be reliable, um, like I think of social media, or like YouTube went down the other day, like the world is not going to grind to a halt. <laughs> um, and they're not really doing, they're doing big files, but not like, I mean, just because of the, the, the amount of stuff they're doing, it is, it is actually really like a lot of data, but that's sort of an artifact of what they're doing rather than the intent. Um, but yeah, it, like if you're just running a web app or if you're running an app on the phone, like for the most part, those are not gonna be great for the platform. It's just, it's gonna be a waste. But if you are doing a lot of data or data crunching, 